Hello, everyone. Welcome to Refraction Wrap. We're delighted you could join us on this last day of Women's History Month. Uh, my name is Esther Lee. I'm the CEO of Refraction, a nonprofit innovation hub and co-working space in Northern Virginia. We provide mentoring programs, office space, $25,000 worth of Amazon Web Services credits and free Uber rides and more for our startups. In the last seven years, we're proud to have helped more than 150 startups that have collectively created 500 jobs and raised $350 million in capital. The person who founded Refraction with a vision of how this could impact the innovation ecosystem in our region is with us today. James Quigley, our chairman and founder, is the serial entrepreneur who is the founder of Go Canvas, which is one of the fastest growing technology companies in North America. He also serves as vice chair of the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority and happens to be a huge supporter of women entrepreneurs. So James, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Esther. And this is a, 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 a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, and just, just to hit on just a few numbers that sort of characterize the, 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 the situation at hand, even though women represent 68% of graduates from college, they only represent about 25% of all, of all team members that join a technology company and a, and a smaller percentage of uh, of female founders. One of the systemic issues, there's there's so many systemic issues and the reasons for that. But one of them I think is sort of partially addressed from today, looking at a, 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 a collective of, of female uh, technology leaders is a lack of a peer group and, and mentors uh, and, and modeling. Um, it, it's crucial uh, that as tech leaders uh, that we continue to enc encourage women to start businesses. Uh, and, and support them in that journey to create models for, for, for young future female leaders to come behind them. So I'm, I'm excited to participate today. Thanks, James. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I think we all know amazing women entrepreneurs, right? Like Anne Wojcicki of 23andMe, Ariana Huffington of HuffPo, or Jennifer Hyman of Rent the Runway. But last year, only 2.3%, let me repeat that, 2.3% of all VC funding went to women-led startups. Now you could say, well, last year was a pandemic. Okay, the year before 2019, we hit an all-time high for funding for women-led startups. It was 2.8%, still woefully low. And um, we know there are lots of reasons for this potentially, right? Um, only about 12% of decision makers at VC firms are women. In fact, most firms don't even have one female partner. Um, and, and, you know, if you look at Boston Consulting Group and other studies, studies show that women-led startups actually tend to uh, perform uh, more successfully than, than men, male-less startups. So there's a lot of work we can uh, still need to do in 2021. And today I'm happy to highlight three fantastic uh, female founders right here in the greater Washington DC region that um, I had the pleasure and privilege of working with. So I'll start with Lisa Gus. Lisa Gus is the CEO and co-founder of Wish Kanish. It's an innovative distributed ledger technology uh, company um, that's uh, working with great customers like the city of Charlotte, North Carolina, Silicon Harlem in New York, and Fairfax County in Virginia. They have a strong partner, uh, strong partners like Oracle and others, and she can tell you more about the many applications of this uh, great proprietary blockchain technology. We also have Kathleen Griggs, who is the president and founder of Data Buoy. It's a cool gunshot detection technology company. In fact, they do a lot more than that, but that's the technology I'm very excited about. And they're already working in places like, like Las Vegas, Annapolis, and New York City. And, and given the, um, the, uh, the increasing number of uh, mass shootings in this country that has not abated, has only gotten worse, I think uh, Kathleen and her company have a huge role to play in addressing how our country deals with these crises. 
And then last but not least, Milani Chatterjee Jen, uh, Len. Um, she's the co-founder of Haven Analytics. It's a brand new nonprofit working to end food insecurity through wastewater-based epidemiology. I'm proud to say when we uh, hosted the Smart City Challenge just a few months ago, her team was the winner of multiple uh, awards uh, because of, of the innovation and, and creative solutions that they put together. And she's a recent MIT graduate. So these are a group of very smart recent uh, college graduates that have put together um, an incredible uh, solution and they're just starting out. So we've got Milani who's just starting out. We've got Kathleen who started her company in 2006. Um, and, and so we're very happy to have all of you welcome. So let me start with um, Kathleen. So tell me, Kathleen, I know um, you, you started your career as a Navy engineer, uh, a DARPA, um, a technical agent, and folks who don't know, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's like the brains behind uh, the Department of Defense and, and really cool technology. In fact, her tech, I believe your technology comes out of DARPA. So Kathleen, tell us a little bit about your company and how, how you, you decide to start it. Um, yeah, so, um, so here, I just happen to have one of these here. We are in the small sensor business. Um, the technology was born out of a DARPA program um, and the only way I can describe it is the experience working with DARPA and what I love to do is, um, I mean, it's kind of one and the same. It's, it's a vision of the future. And, you know, what do we think the future is going to have for us in the next three to five years? And so um, my, my technology is, face, is looking at that in the way that we're looking at the idea of adding infrastructure. Um, you know, what if, if the walls could sense, if the infrastructure around us could help, how would, how would that be built? And, um, and, um, and then on the flip side, the great part about DARPA and the great part about what DataBoo is doing is that we have the freedom and the agency and the funding to actually make this a reality. So, um, so we're really engineering the future. And, um, and so it's, it's a, um, it's a wonderful place to be. We, um, you know, we are, I have, I happened to start this company because I knew some of the best people in the technology area. So I had a team that I knew that could do this, that could implement this vision um, and just the opportunity was there. So if anyone else had the opportunity and the vision, I'm sure they would have been doing the same thing because it's an irresistible thing to say, what's the world gonna be like and how can I make it better? And look, I have the engineers here to do it. And so um, I don't know if that answers that question for you, but. Well, tell us how, how is your technology different? Because I know there are other gunshot detection technologies out there. Um, tell us what makes you unique and, and why you've been successful so far in getting these large cities and others to, to work with you. So that's a great question. So we are, um, so there, there are a lot of folks out there that have built a gunshot detection system in response to the need that says, well, I see that there's a need to detect these guns and I'm gonna build a detector and I'm going to report on what they detected. Um, that's not how we came at the problem. Um, what we came at the problem with was a sensor network and how can seeing a signal from multiple vantage points um, create an advantage that gives you more information than what a single, single detector can do. And so our program started out in the mid 2000s as a, as a intelligence sensor network. So it synchronizing in time and space what they're hearing and fusing that information into a result. And so what we ended up with here is we have a gunshot localization system. Our sensors all detect, they localize, and then they ask themselves, really now from this, from this vantage point, does it make sense that that signal coming from this location is a gunshot? And the superior, that is such a superior solution to a single sensor who has a single sensor doesn't have any information about how far away that source is. So you can, you know, you can create a sound right on top of it that could mimic something or, or that can confuse it from something that could be a source, something super loud a half a block away. If it doesn't have information about where the source is, then it's not the best type. It's not the kind of system that you would really want to trust. Um, so, so we did have that advantage that we grew as a sensor network and, um, and we had time to develop that and we had years to test it and years to put it in different environments. And, you know, I, I can just say that this is, um, you know, that, that, that is, I think the key difference between what we do and what um, 
and what those who are focused on just solving that problem are. So we had a technology that happened to be a perfect fit for that problem versus saying, I'm just gonna find something that detects a loud sound. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Kathleen. Let's go to Lisa. Lisa, you know, for those of us who are not blockchain experts or crypto experts, tell us a little bit about your technology, your proprietary technology for which I think you have patents um, and sort of some of the different applications I, uh, that you're working with these cities. Well, that's a great question. Um, thank you, Esther. So the thing is, first of all, we are not a blockchain. There you go. We are a distributed ledger technology that does exactly the things that blockchain was supposed to really solve for the world. And what uh, Mark Andreessen back in 2008 actually mentioned was uh, the breakthrough whose importance could not be overstated. The thing is, blockchain by itself is a great idea, but it's limiting. Because when you can consider what a blockchain is, it's a series of blocks that records data. But when the blocks are actually coming together, they're pretty slow. They're pretty slow to form and they're slow to transmit along the different nodes that are maintaining the same ledger across the world, basically. And so what we are creating is something that's more, actually more similar to a decentralized web. It's really a web of data and a web of trust um, that keeps that pieces of um, sh sharded data in their silos. And what we do is, um, create an ability for the data to travel between those silos safely, transparently, and countably, and cheaply. Um, because one of the issues with the traditional blockchain ecosystems is that they're expensive. When we're looking at Ethereum, which is really the gold standard these days, and that's, I mean, it is a giant on whose shoulders we are standing, it's expensive. And when we're talking about governments and we're talking about businesses, I mean, they cannot really afford to transact as easily as they were hoping they would when they started, when they gotten started. So we are providing a solution for them to migrate to our technology or start from scratch. That's great. Well, tell me, because for in the Smart City Challenge, you guys were one of, uh, I think, two companies that were selected by Fairfax County. And for those of you who don't know, Fairfax County is the largest county in Virginia. It's about 1.2 million people. Uh, you were selected to do a pilot with them. Tell me a little bit about that pilot project. Right. Well, that's actually another good question. Um, so when we came out of Stealth in late 2019, we came out with what was really a DLT. It is standalone data layer. And at the same time, as we provided a lot of um, freedom for companies with which we worked with to try and use anything they wanted um, data layer for, we kind of also gave them, you know, really a conundrum, like, well, what do we really do with it? So uh, throughout the 2020, what we focused on is building standalone modules, Knish Pass, Knish Aid, and Knish Kids. Now, Knish Kids is a solution that actually um, got us a pilot with Fairfax County, and that is a way to provide a framework for community-centric commerce, an ability to really take back uh, control for, you know, really throughout the entire ecosystem, put it back into the hands of both vendors, cons uh, consumers, and local governments, and make sure that most of the um, spend over 70% stays local with the community, which is even more important now when we're trying to rebuild in the wake of COVID-19. Yeah, and it's helping local people buy from local businesses and then some of that, the, the, the profits go get invested back into the community, right? Is Ex exactly, especially when you consider all the jobs saved, all the tax revenue that's coming in from shopping. I mean, why are we sending it all the way across, you know, across the country to Seattle or potentially to China of all things? Why don't we help our local businesses that are making our own fabric, our community here? Right, and I believe in uh, one of the other areas you're using some of those uh, profits to help fund free internet, right? In, in, in New York City, exactly, because one of the installations is actually um, in Harlem. And so there we're actually working with a group that's providing free internet for the residents of communities that are on subsidized housing. That's fantastic. I mean, we all know that uh, still in this country, there are 60 million Americans who have zero internet, which is really shocking in 2021. And something like 150 million Americans have less than broad. 
broadband internet. So I think the kinds of initiatives that you're working on where, where we can help, um, you know, it, come up with innovative ways to fund internet, I think that's fantastic. Well, we'll come back to you, but let's move on to Milani. Milani, um, I, I would love to hear your story. And I see um, a teammate of yours, Catherine, is on as well. And, and feel free to chime in, Catherine. Tell me a little bit about how you all got together. I, I, I think Smart City Challenge was the genesis, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but tell us how you guys got together, formed a team, and came up with this very innovative solution that hands down was was one of the top winners of the Smart City Challenge up against a bunch of you know non-student teams. You guys are all recent grads. Yeah, definitely. That's that's a great question. Um, so it's sort of a funny story actually for for the Smart Cities Challenge. We heard about it from um, a friend and actually heard about it the night before the challenge started. And so um, Andrew, one of my team members, called up everybody he knew who might want something to do with the Smart Cities Challenge. So I got the call from him and I was like, wow, this is a great opportunity to be creative again after undergrad and um, get to work on a project that relates to equity and sustainability in the region. And so um, actually we, we have five team members and a lot of us didn't know each other to begin with, but we quickly were acquainted with each other after working night after night on our project, Haven Analytics. And the actual idea formation was sort of an aggregation of a whole bunch of our different ideas. So um, in the beginning, we started off with sort of a run of the mill brainstorming session with any type of idea for this challenge that seemed like it related to equity and that would also be innovative and just sort of cool to people, something that people would actually want to see. And so um, a lot of us were interested in urban farming and composting and those sorts of things. Um, but then I also had this sort of wacky idea that we could sort of analyze poop. And um, I had heard about it from an MIT startup called Biobot initially, but they more used it for um, COVID now, but also um, illicit drug use tracking. But I thought this could be a great tool to sort of interplay with our urban farming idea and actually analyze whether these urban farming initiatives, which are gaining a lot of traction in DC, are actually successful at what they're aiming to do, which is presumably to increase nutrition in food insecure um, parts of DC, like wards five, seven, and eight. And so that, that was sort of the, the genesis of our idea to start Haven Analytics, which is using wastewater-based epidemiology, which is essentially just um, sewage analysis to um, come up with a solution to food insecurity. And have you had, I, I know you guys are still just starting, um, have you had good discussions with partners or governments or folks that, that might be interested in partnering with you? Yeah, yeah, so we've been going in two directions lately. One is sort of developing the technology behind wastewater-based epidemiology for nutrition. Um, as I mentioned, it's not uncommonly used for um, drug use tracking, but it's not so far developed for nutrition, especially in a, a sort of commercial application. So we found a, a few different university labs and we're exploring partnerships there for doing the analysis. And then on the other hand, on the other side of things, we're looking at customer discovery. So we're getting in touch with a whole bunch of different um, localities to see what they would want from this and whether they would want it, because we don't want to keep chasing after this idea of using wastewater waste epidemiology to um, analyze their initiatives if they don't really have an interest in it. So, so those are two avenues we've been pursuing. That's great. And by the way, we want this to be a very interactive discussion. So all of you, it, it, I only have one or two more questions, and then I would love for the entire group to have a conversation, ask questions of the of the speakers. But um, you know, if you have thoughts or comments for them, um, I just want to turn. You know, since it is Women's History Month, I, I do think to me it's. Um, a bit disappointing and depressing that still in 2021, we've been talking about, you know, the lack of funding for women entrepreneurs for a long time. I went to MIT for business school and that was many, many years ago. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I 
I think that I'd love to get your thoughts um, and experiences as entrepreneurs. You know, what are some of the challenges you face? Maybe, I, you know, would love to hear some personal stories, right? I mean, we all have friends who are entrepreneurs in uh, different fields. And so maybe you could say, you know, that this is something I was asked. I don't think my my friend who's a, a man was asked that question, right? Or, or other things that you might be able to share. So Kathleen, maybe I'll start with you since you've been, um, you know, you, you found a data boy many years ago. I'm sure you have some more stories or things that you might be able to share um, and, and any advice you might have for, for um, aspiring uh, female entrepreneurs. I'm muted. Okay, hi. So. Wow, do I have war stories, you know, because um, you know, I I started my career. Uh, I mean, I don't know what honestly what it would be like to start my career now. And um, but I do have a sense that maybe it's not much different. You know, when you see these numbers, 2.3 percent, I don't think that the world has changed a whole lot. And I personally don't see it changed a whole lot because I one of the things that um, that we know helps in a career is mentorship, right? Um, and when I started working, there were no women managers. Um, there were no women, even branch managers, even, you know, I mean, and, and in, in my, there were women that had jobs, but not engineering jobs. So I, um, I had a huge struggle because I, you know, you have to say how fun this is to have lunch with the boy <laughs> and you know and I struggle with that now I struggle with this today even I can't tell you that I've solved that problem because I'm you know I look around and I still don't see the candidates right that have the experience that I need to fill the particular jobs that we have that you know it's overwhelmingly male when it comes into us and so that's one of the issues is if I were to make an effort to try to bring women in then I'm not seeing the pool at the at at this in this field that I'm in, and um, which is just largely engineering, and it's um, and so I I could say I probably suffer a daily identity crisis still, you know, wondering, um, gee, was I just born in the wrong package here? Because <laughs> this and this is it, you know, when you when you when you talk to venture groups, they look for a package, right? And um, and a lot of times your how people perceive you is how they score you and they never there's a and here's all i can say is that i think there's a percentage of people that score you you know this deep and then there's a percentage of people that look you know that actually can you can somehow penetrate and they can hear your ideas and hear your thoughts and understand that and then and see the substance and for whatever reason <laughs> some people um have that kind of perception and some people don't and you have to struggle with that world um and i think it's still a struggle and that's my you know those are my and there's a lot of war stories because of that friction you know because some people can perceive and some people can't and you have to find a way to make everything work in that environment this is the environment we're in yeah i mean that's i this that that sounds like a depressing story <laughs> um, maybe we can turn this around to something a little more positive. Well, but, I, um... I will. I will say I thought things were changing, especially on mm -hmm. college campuses. I know when when I was an undergraduate, the most popular course at Harvard was um, economics, economics ten. And now today, the most popular course on campus is computer science fifty, which is you know the introductory course. So I ho I was hoping that had changed, but I, I, obviously there's still a lot more to do because you're not seeing the. Um, the number of candidates in the pipeline uh, to fill the kind of roles that that you're looking to fill, and as as the mother of a daughter, uh, I'm 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 big on how do we get more girls and and women to go into STEM and and into tech, uh, and I sit on the board of uh, the Girls in Tech DC um, group. Um, but that that is that is frustrating because obviously you'd like to have a diverse workforce and and um, you want to you know support women. I assume um, so. I, I think there's a lot that's being done in this region um, with GMU and Virginia Tech especially the Virginia Tech's innovation campus, the $1 billion campus in Alexandria and others where we want to do more to get more tech, um, 
tech ready graduates out into the workforce. Um, and I know there's a lot of thought being given to how to encourage more women and people of color as well. But um, I'm sorry to hear that's still the case. And I do think investors, right, having mentors and investors that are um, not that, you know, there's anything wrong with having male investors, but I th think having that diversity of, uh, of perspectives and viewpoints is helpful. And, and I will say there's research out there that shows that companies led by diverse teams actually tend to perform better, right? It's not just like a good thing, nice thing to do. It's actually a, a, the, a, the right thing to do from a business standpoint. Um, so anyways, well, we'll come back to you, Kathleen. Lisa, I would love to hear your thoughts about your personal journey. Um, and I know you're a co-founder with, um, uh, uh, I, I think, your, your husband, uh, and you guys have been an incredible duo uh, from, from the time that I've gotten to know you. Um, but tell me a little bit about sort of many, maybe some challenges that you might have faced or, or stories as a woman CEO and founder. Well, first of all, it's just the fact that he, Eugene, is my husband, um, was a challenge in and of itself. Because, you know, especially when you're trying to raise, uh, one of the questions that I used to come our way before we just kind of decided to keep our relationship, well, you know, strictly business to a lot of people, is that, yeah, but what if you divorce? Or my favorite one, what if he leaves you? And somebody well, actually asked that? Yes. Yes, oh, they did. Oh my goodness. Okay. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't how, what if you leave him? It was what if he leaves you? <laughs> yes, that's exactly how it was. And so it was strange. And I mean, yes, I could see sort of why they asked it because he's a technical founder, but I'm the strategy one. So technically speaking, we are both equally needed. And so you know, the question was weird. And of course, I wouldn't want to jeopardize my relationship with the group. So I kind of said that I will just um, try to make him the best sandwiches I could ever make and make sure that he stays around. But the thing is, um, just for a married couple to be starting a business is something that really is having been, um, it's, it's even greater in a way uh, issue, I guess, in terms of conquering um, the support of VCs. Another conversation I actually had back a couple of years ago, which made me really passionate about women's rights is with a VC and someone I passionately admired back in the day. Um, and that VC actually told me, well, I know it was your idea. I know it's your baby, but as any mother, you should know that it's best to hand the baby off to someone who can do better. Wow. Um, um, I hate to interrupt, but I have heard every, almost every statement that she said. Yes, um, uh, I can second that. <laughs> that is, those have, those have been, th that, those words I've heard a lot. Yes, I agree. It's just true. Believable. Which is why I think it's so amazing that the companies um, like Refraction supporters like James and actually leaders like Helen, who is my advisor and friend and who is here. Hi, Helen. Um, actually um, starting groups like Savitas with a focus specifically on uh, really f female empowerment and ability to work together to pave the way and to create mentorship opportunities and at the same time, support network where we can actually go ahead and share our stories and go, yeah, I heard it, but we are together and we can make things happen for one another. So that's great. Helen, Helen, you're here. So we'd love to hear um, from you as well um, a little bit about this organization that she mentioned. I think, Helene, you're also on the, uh, the advisory board of, of Wishkanish. Would you like to say a few words? Yep, oh, I'm unmuted now. Hi. Um, thank you, Esther, and thank you, Lisa. What, what a great conversation, but how awful that we still have to talk about uh, these comments being made. Um, on the positive side, what I'm seeing um, through Sabatas and um, elsewhere is a lot more women who've been successful and now in investing in other women-led businesses. So I think that's a really positive takeaway that, that we're getting, uh, certainly here in the UK. Um, and yes, I'd love to say a little bit about Sabatas if I may. Um, so I started Sabatas as Pink Shoe, a very... Um, frivolous name for a very serious network back in 2007 where there weren't so many women's networks around and it's really grown since then because we have about 50% of our members are female entrepreneurs 
We have some angel investors, uh, women who are really passionate about investing. We have a lot of technology uh, members. And also I work as an advisor in um, House of Lords here in the UK, but also an advisor to Women 20, which is part of the G20 and also to G7 um, on gender. So we're bringing together policy, investment, the financial sector, and also creating a peer group for successful women so that these awful stories that we're hearing um, from Kathleen and from Lisa, um, hopefully this we will be the last generation that will ever have to tell these stories. So I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank, thank you. you, Helene. What a what a uh, treat to have you join this conversation. Thank you, and um, thank you for all Esther, that you're doing. Yes, you mind if I just jump in? I wanted Please. to say one more thing um, from my perspective, because given what I've gone through in my career, um, in in this, right? When I say I, you sort of run into this, but not all the people, but some of the people. Some people, um, some people, you don't have to do anything to change, and it's a great environment working with. You know, but but some people you do have to change, and so my my view is it's more than just hiring women in. It's more than just having women in the environment. You have to change the environment, and so one thing that I am totally committed to, I mean, since the beginning, is that as a CEO, as a founder, um, that my company is going to be, I would say, a a safe space, a space for equality, a space where we have a protocol, where we have professionalism, where this is, this is a type of environment we, you know, we establish, this is the dialogue we have, this is how we do teamwork, this is how we, and, um, and I found myself um, you know, running into this where I have to continuously train certain people and tell them, well, no, this is, this is the government we have here in this organization. And I totally believe that every organization has a culture and what drives the culture in this company is me. And, um, and so that's, that's part of the commitment. It's not just saying we're gonna sprinkle some women under the hood and it's all gonna be great because they will of course form their, you know, you know, their divisions, right? Unless you do something about that. And so this is one of the other things that I think we have to actively do. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I will say, uh, James, if you could chime in here, James, um, He's a serial entrepreneur, but one of the signature things that he's done in all of his companies is the focus on culture and actually helps set the culture at refraction and just why that is so important, especially at a small, you know, a startup, right? When you're just starting uh, going. So James, do you want to chime in here a little bit about culture and yeah. the kinds of things you've done at Go Canvas? Sure. I was also going to highlight, we, we happen to have on the line here too, and I, I think she may not be... Um, she was on earlier, I saw a picture, Elizabeth Orsinger, who is, uh, we were talking about money and, and, and technology and Elizabeth is, I've known Elizabeth since uh, for over a decade when she was at Comerica. She's probably one of the, the, the leading female technology bankers in the area, has, has worked for PAC uh, Pacific West, uh, 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 Square One, Comerica. Maybe I know your bio better, but I, I'd love to make sure I hit and ask Elizabeth her journey of, of funding and, and seeing uh, from whether it's debt or, or, or other instruments, just uh, your journey of being in, uh, uh, in that side of the world and then also funding businesses um, of different sizes. But from a cultural perspective, um, you know, I thought what, what Kathleen said was was spot on. And, and listen, I, I'm as a white cis dude, as my kids will tell me often, it put me into this little box uh, that um, um, and, and my wife, who was uh, head of culture and helped set up um, refraction, that uh, it's it's not enough to to just s s sprinkle to have your to token female on the board, or you, you have to look at the systems and processes that support a uh, not just a safe environment but an impactful environment um and some of them are are insidious uh, little things that could that uh, come off as microaggressions and, and some are just baked into the tropes of technology companies even simple tropey things i don't know uh, uh, how most companies would see i don't know how a tech company would in the early days uh, would have fun or something like that. You know, the, the tropes along the way have set up an environment that are not 
in, in many cases supportive of women. And also, I, I will just say this is it, until you make an effort to do it systemically, it, it's it, you, it won't change on its own. It just won't. I'll, I'll give one quick story. We had zero female representation in our engineering product um, and UI teams, uh, UI UX teams for, for a long time. Matter of fact, we hired a female recruiter to help solve this problem with a specific mission. And she came back with male uh, candidates, which was shocking to us. Like she goes, well, I know you're still hiring though and I can't find anyone. So would you hire the... And so we had to sort of break it completely down and, and look at everything, how we onboard people, uh, yeah, a, a, every part of the, the, the employee journey. And then we, re, we sort of restarted. And um, a, a combination of then having peer leadership mentors, uh, so making sure you go the extra mile to, to find candidates um, and having the environment I will tell you that uh, I just stepped out as CEO a, a couple of weeks ago, but our product UI UX engineering teams went from 0% representation to nearly 40% representation. It took years, um, uh, but it, 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 it's, it's doable, um, but, but you have to invest in it. And I will tell you some of the best product innovations come out of a diverse um, work team that looks and smells like the people we sell products to. We don't just sell products to white dudes. We sell products to men and women and, you know, and, and you need that representation to have the best possible um, product solutions and offering the market. But I, I would love to hear from Elizabeth too, just uh, as someone who's been in the, the technology banking business for as long as you have been and, and any reflections you have yeah. on, uh, on this. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, definitely, I think if we go back, I don't know, a couple of years, right, it seemed a lot of women kind of just stopped at the CFO role. Um, and so I think, you know, seeing women, you know, just as, um, you know, mentors or, or, you know, there might be just one person who's a CEO, but it, it's such a guiding light for other women to see that. And obviously, you know, if we rewind just, you know, 15 years ago, was, I can't even, you know, maybe one, maybe if and I'm just guessing, I can't even think of a name, but you know, and I'm speaking more like focused on the mid Atlantic area. Um, but I think to your point, Jim, just on um, doing a broadcast, a, a bigger, you know, you're not changing the caliber of potential that you're looking for, right? We aren't grading. Well, we need more women. So we have to change our grading scale. That's not happening. It's just, you have a wider net. And I think, you know, going from, you know, earlier days of being banking and being the only woman to, you know, now, for instance, at, you know, Pac West Bank, where we do you know, lending to startup companies, we have a team that has, you know, out of a team of seven, you know, four of them are women. And, you know, not necessarily that, you know, that was the top priority, but we did expand the net to make sure, like, who are we broadcasting to? And we got to ensure that it's more inclusive, right, of, of other folks. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Liza. Thanks for joining us. I hope you'll continue to work with um, the, the startups in this uh, region. There are a lot of them and, and, and great startups that need, you know, folks uh, like you to help. So thank you. Um, let me turn to Milani and Catherine, since you all, you know, you guys are recent grads and you might have um, hopefully more hopeful uh, things to share um, about, about um, sort of women embarking early in their startup um, careers. Uh, what have you seen sort of uh, Milani at MIT and Catherine sort of in college as well? And sort of, um, you know, I know you guys are just early in your journey, but things you might have seen or, or faced that you wanna share with us to, to contribute to this conversation. Um, so for, for me, something that was really encouraging during undergrad actually was that um, MIT, when I attended a couple of years ago was 52% men and 48% women, which is really a big difference than um, some of my mom's friends who went there 30 years prior. So that in and of itself was really, really made it more of a welcoming environment. Um, but that being said, I think with startups, startups were always sort of floating around MIT. 
they were still definitely more male dominated. And that was sort of like a soft barrier to entry um, for a lot of people, I think. I, I guess, like, I agree that even if there's nothing necessarily stopping you from entering an industry, it's not necessarily super appealing to go work for a startup that's all men if you're going to be the only woman there. So um, that being said, though, I think something that has been really encouraging to me is when I participated in the Smart Cities Challenge with Catherine and the rest of our team, um, one of the things we were surprised by is the number of women who were represented, like Kathleen and Lisa, um, in the, the um, companies that entered. And I think that may be related to the fact that it wasn't solely a startup competition. It really related to equity and social impact. Um, but nevertheless, that was really exciting for me because I saw people who looked more like me who were farther along in the process. So I think that'll make a difference going forward. Yeah. How about you, Catherine? Any thoughts? Hi, thanks for thanks for including me. Um, uh, I mean, it comes to my mind just going off of what Milani said, my college, Georgia Tech, was trying to get women, more women um, represented on the campus as well. And at, when I went, the peak was 40% uh, women, 60% men. And I think that was up from 30% to 70%. Um, so I think more representation is definitely helping um, and encouraging more people, more women to uh, step up into leadership roles and giving them the opportunity. I definitely feel like I've felt like I've been given some opportunities along the ways that um, maybe weren't always present um, at the time, which is great, but I, <laughs> I, I really think that um, having the support of each other, like um, working on this project um, having another woman to start our company in a way and, and having um, other team members that encourage us to voice our opinions and encourage us to, um, you know, go through with our process, that really makes a difference. We have, I haven't, and I know Milani, we've had conversations um, in the past, we haven't really had experiences like um, Kathleen and Lisa have maybe in the future. Um, maybe we'll learn from these um, talks, but uh, I think that's because women like you have been paving the way for us, and we are grateful for that. Um, so that's you. great. Well, thank you, and Catherine, I'm so glad you guys are part of this great team. And you know, you know, I hope you'll take to heart the advice about culture, how important culture is, and um, you know, making sure you have a culture that's welcoming to women and people of color and all of that. And and Milani, your point about Smart City Challenge, we actually made it a big uh, goal of ours to be very inclusive, which is why we partnered with folks like Girls in Tech DC and others to make sure that you know, often when you go to a hackathon, there are a lot of white males, which is great. Just you know. Know, not a lot of other folks. And so, um, so I think, you know, I, I'm really proud of the fact that we had a lot of women and a lot of people of color participating. And, you know, in this whole conversation, we need a lot of allies. I mean, we've talked about it's, it's part of the national conversation around race and uh, social justice and everything else. And so I'm really excited that James and Judd, you're here as well. So Judd is uh, um, uh, another refraction member, a serial entrepreneur, part of this great group called EO. Judd, do you want to take a few minutes, tell us a little bit about that, and then tell us your thoughts on how you know groups like EO and others can help um, women entrepreneurs on their journey? Well, uh, so I've been in EO for 15 years. I, I grew a company from scratch, sold it uh, last year. We had 36 employees, sold it for 35 or for 5 million, um, but it was, a, it was a $36 million company. And then I started another company, but EO was instrumental to all parts of that. So whether you're male or female, being an entrepreneur has its challenges, whether it's at, at home or in the business. And EO, the group of entrepreneurs that you meet with monthly and your forum, you have a group of six business owners, seven business owners, both men and women together that meet. We know more about each other's families and businesses than the spouses do. And uh, so it's just an amazing experience. And we were very limited in the beginning. I think the, it was probably at 90, 10% you know, difference in men, to, women to men. Now it's 26, we're up to 26% and we focused the last three years and we're going, continuing forward, focusing on bringing in women entrepreneurs. And it's just enriched our group so much to have that. 
and to have those type of uh, experiences with them. And so I, I would challenge every one of you to take a look at that and uh, or a group like us, but it's just, it's just an amazing experience. And it helped me save a company when the recession hit in 2008 and grow up from there to where I sold it. So it's just, it's just an amazing experience. And we bring in both women speakers, uh, men speakers, and it's just, it's all about the entrepreneurial journey. And, uh, and we're trying to focus more on women in our group now. And That's it's fantastic. That's fantastic. Judd, if you don't mind putting your contact info, maybe they can reach out to you or the website. Or, uh, one that, last thing, I, 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 in part of BO, we have a Global Student Entrepreneur Award. And that's where we take kids that are in college and we have competitions all over the world. And we finally, we meet in one place in the globe. That, when I, last year we had it before COVID was in Macau, China. And we had a woman entrepreneur, student entrepreneur win it from New York. And that was through all the world, right? So it was really cool. And I got to see more women starting companies because I'm a pretty old guy now, old white guy, seeing more women of all color creed race start these businesses and i see it more that that percentage like somebody else mentioned earlier is getting more even as we go as the younger people are coming up so i i'm really heartened i put my contact information in there thank you Judd. i appreciate it and thanks for all the great work you guys are doing over there and then last but not least dina i see that you put in a question maybe you could unmute yourself and and ask the question directly Let's see. Oh, I'm not I'm not sitting in the dark. It's actually dark here. <laughs> Calling from uh, Toulouse, France. And thank you so much, Lisa, for inviting me. Um, I shifted my career from fashion into coaching. So um, talk about a women led uh, industry that has a lot of these same challenges, but in a different direction. Um, and now I'm coaching. So I want to know what would be the number one advice that each one of these incredible women would give a young entrepreneur starting up, starting her startup in tech. And just to kind of put another one on top of that, what would have been the, the thing that they would have wished they had when they started in terms of support? Great, thank you for calling in from France. Wow. Um, so uh, Lisa, do you wanna start? You're on mute, Lisa, start over. <laughs> yes, apologies. Yeah, um, actually that's a great question. And I think um, I will take, tackle the second question first in saying that I think I would really love someone to come and tell me it's okay to fail because entrepreneurs do fail and we can't really expect that we don't. And it really would be great if there were a better support network for when we do, because when you think about it, our success is really success of nations and potentially of our communities and jobs that we give out. And yet our failures are our own. Um, and so, it's okay to fail. And at the same time, it's okay to ask for help. So that would be the advice I would give. That's great. Kathleen? Oh, uh, hi. So my advice, I think, is, um, I mean, it's the reason why I'm still doing this and still loving this, right? Um, and um, and I, it's just the old saying, sticks and stones will, you know, break my bones, but names are never going to hurt me. And um, and so I think my, I, you have one life to live. I've always looked at it this way that, you know, this is what I want to do with my time here on earth. And, um, and no matter what barriers get thrown at me, I wake up every day and I go, oh, I think there's something else I can try here. <laughs> and, um, you know, and nothing really seems to take that away from, you know, it's, it's the, you know, don't let other people take that dream away from you. Um, you know, it's your dream. And, as long as you can continue to pursue it, go do it. And um, that's, and like, um, like Lisa said, um, failures are just hurdles, um, you know, and if you just continue to look at it as, well, what else can I try? Then, um, then that's that, you know, you end up living a pretty great um, existence. You can, you can accomplish a lot if you don't let people get in your way. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what I do. 
I love it. Thank you, Kathleen. Last but not least, Milani. Yeah, maybe I'm the least qualified to answer this question, but I think for me, something that, that's been really helpful um, going through MIT and also starting up Haven Analytics is sticking with that fake it till you make it mentality um, throughout this process. We, we were basically, our team was intimidated by on day one. Um, we didn't really realize that there would be really established startups in this competition. And so um, we were a little bit frantic, but we actually had this amazing female mentor who um, scheduled a meeting with us at 6.30 a.m. the day after she found out that we were assigned to her. And even before hearing our project idea, she looked at us and said, you guys are going to win this competition. And so at that point, we were all sort of shocked and didn't know what to say or do. But that sort of gave us the boost we needed to continue through the competition thinking like, this is something that's attainable for us and we do belong here. And so I think that's that's been the number one thing for me. That's awesome. What a great note. I have to say, I am encouraged, even though the numbers don't show it yet um, nationally, that we have some incredible women entrepreneurs all across this country and especially in this region. Uh, and we're lucky at Refraction to get to work with many of them and lucky to have people like James and Judd and others who are allies in this in this journey to um, encourage more entrepreneurs. So, James, any closing thoughts before we go? No, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Yeah. Well, great. I, I, I just want to thank everyone for their time. This was actually live streamed on Facebook. So if you want to share it with friends who weren't able to make it great. Um, and if you know of startups who um, are looking for to join a great entrepreneurial community, please uh, check us out at refractionpoint.org. So with that, thank you everyone for taking some time out of your busy day to join us and look forward to seeing you at the next Refraction Wrap. Thank you.